go on to, to, to a new topic. In this week's Parsha, we have the mitzvah of bringing the first fruits, right? The Torah says that uh, you come to Eretz Israel and uh, there are seven species, right? The wheat and the barley and the gefen, the te'ina, the limon, zeit shemen, udvash, which means date honey. And if you have fruits, including wheat and barley, we don't call them fruits, but the uh, chitad, sova, any of the shavat aminim, so the first fruits that ripen from each of these species, the farmer in the land of Israel, he puts a string around the first date that ripens, the first grape that ripens, and later he will bring it to Yerushalayim to be given to the Kohanim, and when he brings them to Yerushalayim, he recites a mini-history of the Jewish people uh, in only four verses. And in fact, that mini-history is incorporated in the Haggadah of Pesach. Arami Oved Avi, love on the Aramean from Syria, tried to destroy my father. Vayered Mitzrayim, and my father went down to Egypt. And we became in Mitzrayim, from 70 people, we became a great nation. And God took us, and then we were enslaved, and then God took us out of Mitzrayim with great miracles. And behold, I have come to the land to express my thanks to HaKadosh Baruch. But if you remember, these four verses, Arami Obedavi, Vyerid Mitzrayma, this is the foundation of the Haggadah of Pesach, in which we then take each little phrase and we give interpretations and directions. Now this is a part of the Haggadah that people might fall asleep for, because it's kind of in the middle. It's a very important part of the Haggadah, but it doesn't get the same press as the four sons and, and the Manishtana, which is the beginning of the Seder. But the truth of the matter is, a lot of that stuff that people love to talk about, the four sons, that is an introduction to the Haggadah. That's not the actual story of Yitziat Mitzrayim. The actual story of Yitziat Mitzrayim are these four verses, Arami Oved Avi, which Chazal ben Darshan, uh, each segment of that prophet. So these are two different mitzvahs. There's a mitzvah called Havo'at Bikurim, the bringing of the Bikurim to the Beit HaMikdash, and then there's a separate mitzvah called Kriyat Bikurim, the recitation of a declaration that you say when you bring the Bikurim. Now, there's a whole tractate in the Talmud called Masechet Bikurim, and in the third parak of Bikurim, it describes the ceremony with great, great pageantry and detail that different people, different cities would come to Yerushalayim at different times, and there would be processions, and all of the workers, the artisans who would be working like blacksmiths, when a procession came from, uh, from B'nai Brak or Tel Aviv or whatever it would be, they would stand up and say, Welcome, Ruchim Habahim L'Shalom, because if the people were honored, in fact, Rav Soloveitchik uh, writes that the Minog, why do we stand up when a Chatan or a Kala comes down the Chuppah? Actually, it's a relatively new custom. It's interesting. Now everybody does it. Uh, this was not really done in, in Europe or whatever, but now it's kind of a thing to do. So most people answer, well, the reason we stand up for a chatan and even a kala is because chatan dome lamelech. A chatan is like a king, and by extension, a kala is like a queen, so you stand up for royalty. But that's not a good answer, really, because when they're walking down the aisle, they haven't been coronated yet. Chatan becomes a melech only when he gives the ring. So maybe stand up when he comes back from the chuppah, but not when he's going to the chuppah. So Rav Soloveitchik gave another reason. He said, you see from Masechus Bikurim that when a person is going to do a mitzvah, like bringing the Bikurim, we stand in his honor. So he says, the Chatan is about to do the mitzvah of Kiddushim. The Rambam actually says that there is a mitzvah to marry. It's not just a mitzvah to have children. That's true also. It's a mitzvah to get married. And therefore the Chatan who is about to be Osek for mitzvah, we stand up in his honor just as they stood up for the people that were bringing Bikurim. So the Mishnah in the third paragraph of Bikurim describes the ceremony with great, great pageantry and detail. Now it mentions the following. It mentions that rich people would bring their Bikurim in baskets of gold and silver. And when they would give it to the Kohanim, they would get their baskets back because the baskets were worth, worth a lot. Poor people would bring their Bikurim in baskets of simple wicker. 
and they wouldn't get it back. It was they were embarrassed to ask for their baskets back, so uh, the Kohanim kept the baskets. And from here, the Gemara in Baba Kama says, we see Basar Anya Azla Aniyusa, which means the poor people get poor, meaning you're so poor that you bring a wicker basket, you lose the basket too. Right? Poor people get the shaft. When you're poor, you become poorer. So, the Tosos Yamtuf asks an interesting question. You know, we find that by funerals, it used to be the old way that a funeral was conducted was that if you were rich, you were buried in a much fancy coffin, a coffin of, of gold or whatever it would be. And if you were poor, you were buried in a poor way. And rich people were buried in rich clothing, fancy clothes. And poor people were buried very, very simply, meaning you were buried according to your economic condition. But what happened was that people who were poor were humiliated. They were embarrassed. They couldn't keep up. They couldn't drink. So sometimes, God forbid, they would even abandon the mace in the street and the kahila would take over. So Rabbi Gamliel, the Nasi, the head of the Sanhedrin, the most honored position in Am Yisrael, left instructions that when he died, he should be buried in a plain wooden coffin with no adornments. What's his name? Rabbi Gamliel. Gamliel. Rabbi Gamliel. Plain a coffin and in plain white tachrichim. And from that time, it has now become the universal minag of Klal Yisrael that we bury everybody in the same way, the simple coffin and the white tachrichim. Now, it happens to be, at least in Chutzlaritz, Eretz Sober Hashem is a little different. In Chutzlaritz, funerals, even the simple funeral, is surprisingly expensive. And many, many people have great financial difficulties. You know, the plain pine box and the simple tachrichim still winds up costing uh, between seven thousand and eight eight thousand dollars. You know, so it's not a it's not a pleasure thing for many people. Uh, but the ideal was that it should be very simple, it should be inexpensive, and the reason is Sholo Levayesh, not to humiliate me Sha'in Lo, a person who doesn't have those resources. Lo Levayesh as me Sha'in Lo. That's why in, uh, in the nineteen sixties there was an unscrupulous, although quite brilliant, an unscrupulous funeral parlor in New York, Jewish, that was trying to market fancy, expensive, uh, carved wooden coffins. And their advertisement says this way, you should do a funeral the way Jews originally did funerals, without innovations and modern changes. Now, in a sense, they were right, because pre Rabbi Gamliel, indeed, that is the way they did it. So they were saying, the simple coffin is a reform innovation that does not represent the original way of doing it. Well, if you go back 2,000 years, indeed, <laughs> that is correct, although it's quite an unscrupulous uh, way of presenting it. Uh, yeah? It's exactly the opposite of what's happening I don't remember his name. Who used to have weddings of 10,000 people. Yeah. And he decided that there's no more than 200 people. Yes, that's for weddings. We have a similar problem with weddings. Who was that? I think it was the, I think it was the Gary Rebbe. But uh, there were a number of Hasidic Rebbe's that made it's such exactly weddings. Exactly the same idea. Yes, exactly the same. That's right. But already in the Gemara, it's for funerals, and more modern people have extended it to, to weddings as well. Yeah. Although they, okay, well, okay. They tend to exclude themselves, but okay, there, there are reasons for that. If you're a Rebbe, you can't. <laughs> If you're a Rebbe, you can't make a, a small wedding. But okay. Uh, now, the thing is this. So the Tosfos Yomtev, great commentary on the Mishnah, asks the Kacha, if in the case of funerals, we don't want there to be a distinction between rich people and poor people, that they shouldn't be humiliated, why didn't the Chachamim make a similar Gezerah in the case of Bikurim? Because in Bikurim, what you're saying is, rich people bring fancy, and poor people bring simple. Why don't we enact that everybody brings simple? Not to create embarrassment. For example, besides funerals, let me give you another example. The 15th of Av, right, one month ago, literally one month ago, that was the great marriage day in which women would go out and men would choose who they would marry. So the Mishnah describes it as all of the women wore borrowed uh, clothing, 
and it was a simple white uh, white dress, meaning you didn't have any discrimination based on rich or poor. So why by Bikurim do all of a sudden we introduce this concept of discrimination where somebody sees you're rich and I'm poor? We ought to make it all equal then. So the Tosas Yaptev himself gives a teret. You're right. Normally we should aim for equality, egalitarianism in serving God. But since this is a ceremony that's taking place in the Beit HaMikdash, and therefore the more elaborate it is, the more honor and homage and kavod you are p- paying to Hashem in the Beis HaLokeinu. So he says, for that reason, we encourage people to do the fanciest they can, because that is kavod la mikdash, that is honor to the Beit HaMikdash, and that is kavod la shechina. Okay, this is the Tosas Yom Tov answer. Didn't hear you. Uh, okay, so therefore, uh, uh, in other words, we don't make it because they write me. Okay, okay, that would that would be it. But but this is not a. Okay, this is not. See, ancient with Mikdash is referring to when we make is a rot that, for example, you don't blow shofar over Rosh Hashanah, Pazav, and Shabbos. So in the Beit Hamikdash, you do blow the shofar because we say in the Beit Hamikdash, people are conscientious and they're not going to transgress. This is a different type of shvut. This is a shvut of not embarrassing people. Uh-huh. But the Tosas Yom Tov says that also in the Beit HaMikdash we set aside. But there might be another answer that's a little deeper. And that answer is the following. Everyone knows there's a well-known Mishnah in Masechus Brachos, in the last parak. Chaya v'adam levareich al hara'a kederech she mevareich al tova. A person, this is Rabbi Meir says this, a person must bless Hashem for the bad tidings that happen to them, death, destruction, the same way they bless Hashem for the good. Now this doesn't mean it's the same bracha. Obviously, when bad tragedies happen, there's a special bracha, Dayan Ho'emet, God is the true judge. When good things happen, we make a bracha, Shehechayanu, or Hatov Ha'metiv, so the Gemara explains right away, we don't mean you make the same bracha, but it means you have the same attitude of accepting Hashem's will as good. Now even then, it's a complicated thing. Nobody is saying that the way I express my joy when I get a great, great gift is the same as my feelings when, God forbid, a relative dies. So you know, you're not gonna, you know, it doesn't say, dance on the table if a person lost a parent. That certainly doesn't make sense. But it means that in the inner resources of your heart, we try to understand that everything that Hashem does is ultimately for the good. I don't know why, I don't know how. It doesn't always make sense to me. Maybe it very rarely makes sense to me. But there is a purpose, and there is a goal, and there is an end game, so to speak. There is a tachlis in everything that happens in the world. Again, this does not fit the Rambam's view that well, that's 100%. But the idea of Gamzu, in fact, the whole statement, everything Hashem does for the good, needs to be understood in light of the Rambam. But if you don't go with the Rambam's view, and you go with the simple meaning of the Gemara, this is Gamzu Latova. Right? So this is a very important idea in Judaism. In fact, uh, there's a story, some people don't like this story, but there's a famous Hasidic story that uh, somebody asked the Mezurich or Magid, the Mezurich Ramadi, the Baal Shem Tov's successor. I don't understand how a person could accept the bad and the difficulty in life with the same simcha that they accept the good. I don't understand it. So the Mezurich Ramadi said, go to my Talmud, Rav Zusha. He will explain this passage. So he goes to Rav Zusha. Rav Zusha is living in poverty and he has children who don't have food and don't have clothing and the house is falling in and the, and the rain is going through the roof and he doesn't know and the guy that's coming doesn't know why would Rav Zusha be able to explain this to me but he says hey Rav Zusha, you Zusha he says yeah I'm Zusha he says the Rebbe said you can explain to me what does it mean to be feel the same simcha for the bad as for the good and Rav Zusha looks very perplexed and says I don't know why the Rebbe sent you to me nothing bad has ever happened <laughs> now some, some love that story, indeed. Some say, well, 
that kind of almost approach is lahavdil, 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 approaches a sense of Buddhism in which evil is an illusion. Uh, many say Judaism recognizes the reality of suffering. It recognizes the reality of bad things happening. It doesn't deny that sense of destruction. But it says it's not senseless, it's not purposeless. That there is a light within the darkness. So this is very beautiful, and again, this deserves a whole talk of itself, the book of Job and everything. But what's interesting is this. Rabbi Meir, who teaches this teaching, has a source for it. And the source for it is a pasuk that says, Bisamachta b'chol hatov, you shall rejoice in all of the good, asher Hashem elokecha nosein lach, that God gives you. Now what's the drasha? Look at the two names of God. Hashem and Elokecha. Hashem is Yudke Vavke. That's the name of God that is used for Rachamim. Elokecha is Elokim. According to Chazal, although not in modern Hebrew usage, but according to Chazal, Elokim is not just the term for God. Elokim is specifically the term for God that we use when we refer to God's attribute of justice and punishment. So what does the Pasuk say? Sometimes there's Hashem, I perceive mercy, and sometimes Elokecha, I perceive din. But no matter what, the Samachta B'chalatov, you shall rejoice that it's all good in one way or the other. We learn, we learn, right? We learn from adversity. We grow from these challenges. We develop capacities of resilience inner strength. It's a painful, laborious, difficult process. And we often wish, why did we have to go through this? Sure. But ultimately, there's a hatata. Yeah. Well, it's a subject. That's a beautiful subject. How yes. People perceive this. How you put yob in this? How do you put yob? Well, yeah, that, that, that we need to. That, that's a whole other talk. I mean, but again, but the ultimate lesson of the Book of Eov is exactly that, okay, because it's exactly yes. that. This is, this is it. This is what the message is. The message is you have suffered, but from that suffering, you have become a different person. You he become a more understanding. Send me more bed. Well, I don't know if he. I don't know if he exactly asked God for it, but but he understood. Eov at the end of the day, except. He accepted what God gave. He asked them because his wife, this is the reason why she left them. <laughs> well, well, she said to him, curse God and he'll finish you up. And he uh, doesn't say she, well, okay, doesn't say, well, she makes one brief appearance and then she kind of disappears. Do you want to, su you want to suggest she left him? I'm not, I'm not sure if that's exactly what happened, but okay, yeah. This concern about embarrassment is not absent from the Quran because it uh, talks to the Mishnah about uh, that when, uh, there was a time when people weren't able to speak. Right, I, I, I will get to that. that that's again yeah. a good question. Okay, so this is Rabbi Meir's origin. Now, what's interesting is this. Rabbi Meir is a nice drasha based on that pasuk. But do you know that that pasuk actually appears in Bikurim? So it's a strange thing. Bikurim is the source of the idea Chayav Adam levarech al hara'a kederech shemevarech al atova. That pasuk for samachta b'chol atov is in the parsha of Bikurim. Now that's very strange. How does Bikurim connect at all to the notion of being grateful, or not grateful, being, being accepting and understanding of even the difficulties? So the answer is. Bikurim, in a very, very gentle and kind way, teaches a human being to accept deprivation. In a very gentle way. Because what is this? Bikurim is the very first fruit of a person's labor. The very first fruit of a person's labor. A person cherishes very much. You know, people frame in their business the first dollar they made, the first shekel they made, whatever it would be because they work hard and they finally get something. And what does Hashem say? The first fruit of your labor that you cherish, that you love, you don't get to keep it. 
you have to give up. Now, of course, overall, it's a joyous context. But it reminds a person that sometimes in life, what you loved the most, you lose. You have to give up. Bikurim is an indirect lesson in understanding that in life there is sacrifices. In life you understand that even the difficulties, even the deprivations, even the forfeitures have a purpose. And you accept them and you rejoice them. Enjoys them. So Bikurim is in fact an indirect, gentle lesson, indeed, in accepting that sometimes our task in life is to know how to let go of that which we treasure and rejoice in it. So now we understand the following. If Bikurim is a lesson in accepting even the negatives as a higher good pursuant to God's will. Then at that point, Bikurim means you accept who you are without being ashamed. The poor, what are you going to say? We, we ask the question, why do poor people bring wicker and rich people bring gold and silver? We ought to be concerned for shame and embarrassment. But that presupposes that the poor person is supposed to be ashamed. There's going to be ashamed of his poverty. Or the rich person might be self-conscious of the wealth that God gave him. But Bikurim is understanding that what Hashem puts into your life is good. And the poverty has its good side and the wealth has its good side. And Bikurim is accept who you are and rejoice in it. So we're not going to say to the poor person, be ashamed of your poverty. And therefore we're going to make everybody the same. Bikurim is a lesson in accepting the ra'ah just like the tova and therefore we don't cover up. You are who you are and you rejoice in it. You understand that if I am poor there is much I can contribute based not, not in money but based on my avodah Hashem with Mesiris Nefesh. And if I am wealthy that's also nothing to be ashamed about or embarrassed about. Although I think about a uh, very clever remark, very cutting remark that Rav Steinman once had uh, a gentleman came to him in B'nai Brak. He said that he's a very successful businessman and he needs to buy a fancy car, but he's uh, afraid of Ayin Ara. He's afraid people will look at him and be jealous of him and that may have negative effects. So Steinman said to him, uh, have you finished the Talmud? He says, uh, no, I haven't. Uh, do you learn Torah several hours every day. And the person said, well, not every day. So Steinman says, I don't understand your question. What will people be jealous of you for? <laughs> <laughs> so I think the person got the message. He said, there's no, there's no I in our. But be it as it may, but certainly a wealthy person has many avenues of serving Hashem as well. So Mamela, by Bikurim, we don't have the concept of being ashamed who you are. Now, there is, however, one instance, you pointed out correctly, that even by Bikurim, uh, Chazal were concerned with not embarrassing people, and that is the procedure of recitation. Originally, it says, if I was able to read, or I knew the verses, I bring my Bikurim and I recite the verses. If I did not know how to read, the Kohen would say the words and I would repeat after the Kohen. Now, what happened was, people who didn't know how to read were embarrassed. They were humiliated by their lack of uh, education. So Chazal made a uniform takana that whether you know how to read or not, the Kohen recites. Now, you may say, this contradicts my point, that by Bikurim, we're not concerned with embarrassment because each person should accept his station in life. The answer is no. That even though it's true that Bikurim says, don't be embarrassed about your station in life. There is one thing you should be ashamed about, and that is your failure to learn basic Torah. Meaning, but look how wonderful it is. See, on one hand, we don't want, see, listen to this beautiful lesson. We don't want to embarrass the ignorant person. 
but we want him to know privately that this is something he should be ashamed about. This is truly a genius way of doing it. Meaning, if we wanted to shame him, we would indeed go back to the system that if you can't read, we'll read it to you. We don't want to shame him. But we want him to know this is something he should be ashamed about. So how do we do it? We say, in order not to embarrass the illiterates, we will read it for everybody. So that's a tremendous muster. Meaning, don't be ashamed if you're poor. Don't be ashamed if you're rich or embarrassed if you're rich. But if a person could have learned some basic Torah and didn't, that is isn't cause to be embarrassed and ashamed. You know, it's interesting that today, Baruch Hashem, the avenues for learning Torah are greatly, greatly expanded over really almost all of history. Besides all of the classes, all of the teachers, you now have the internet, which although the internet has many, many, many pigamim, many chesronot, but on the other hand, uh, it's amazing the amount of, of Jewish learning. And yet, like everything else, you have to sift through it. Not everything is, is so good, but the tremendous amount of Jewish learning. And even Svarim now, if you go to a, a free database, like, of course, this is not in, not in English, but a free database like HebrewBooks.org, uh, you can get literally, uh, what, I think it's up to 60,000 Svarim uh, for free. And then you go to Otsara Chachma, which costs money, you know, you can get like 80,000, 90,000 Svarim for free. Right? Or not for free, you pay some money, but you know, for $2,000, it's a great buy. $2,000 for 80,000 Svarim, that, that's quite a, uh, quite a good price. So, and of course, things are in English, and there are videos and, and, and YouTubes and, and amazing, amazing, amazing amount of Torah. But that creates an achrayut, meaning to say, when HaKadosh Baruch Hu creates more opportunity, there is a greater responsibility to take advantage of that. Right? Uh, in the olden days, maybe a person had an excuse. I didn't know, I didn't learn, I had no one to go to. Today, the excuses kind of go away. So that's the one situation. So Bikurim is a lesson not to be downtrodden in uh, rich, poor, but you know, not, not taking advantage of basic Torah knowledge. That's something to be ashamed of. Now, there is a general message in Shuba as well. I've mentioned a number of times already the idea that Shuba on one level is about change, but on another level it's also about self-acceptance. Because every person is different, every person has different talents, every person has different capacities. And sometimes we get depressed because we look at other people who might excel in this area and that area, and I feel I fa I've fallen short. But the truth of the matter is, tshuva, which involves constructive positive change, is also premised on fundamentally accepting yourself as a good and valuable person based on your talents and your abilities. And that is why tshuva, which literally means return, is not just returning to God, but it's returning to the essential part of your nature that is good and that is holy. And therefore, paradoxically, the hyper-awareness of fault that is part of the introspection and the cheshven nefesh of tshuva must also be predicated on an overall awareness that I am a good person, I am a worthy person, I am a person who can do good and bring good to the world, to myself and to others. And only when one has that awareness that who I am is fundamentally good can I then work on the particulars that might need to be corrected or fine-tuned? So if the message of Bikurim is to understand that whatever God gives me in my life is fundamentally good, that also refers to my personality, my environment, uh, the situation that I find myself in, that even though I might think from my perspective it is not an optimal situation, but I have to find the good within the situation that I'm in. Again, like the prayer of the alcoholics and the alcoholics and the uh, that which you can change, 
you try to change, but that which you cannot change, you need the so you need the ability to accept and work with it, and then you need the insight to know the difference between what do you change and what you cannot change. So, Ushuale, Exil Simatova, a year in which we realize the goodness within ourselves, and from the realization of that goodness, we will then rectify whatever flaws needs to be rectified. Yeah.